right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Erin Maney, if I don't know you, and I am the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement for Open SUNY. On behalf of the whole Open SUNY team, I want to welcome you to this fellow chat. The Open SUNY Fellow Chat series features our Open SUNY Fellows and their work to support our mission of networking, interaction, and excellence in online teaching and learning practices. I just want to briefly introduce you to our community. If you're not familiar, Open SUNY Fellows are members of SUNY campuses and friends of SUNY from partner organizations and institutions. Our, um, our community represents expertise uh, in online teaching and learning through a variety of engagement opportunities, such as today's fellow chat webinar. Once we begin, I will post a link in the chat to invite you to join our dynamic community if you are interested in doing so. Our fellow chat today showcases how students in online history and economics classes participated in metacognition building activities through a low stakes weekly discussion forum called the Metacognitive Cafe, which I just love. We are joined today by Judith Littlejohn and John Kane. Judy is the instructional designer at SUNY Genesee Community College and teaches history courses online. And John is a professor of economics and the director of the Center uh, for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at SUNY Oswego. So thank you both for joining us today and I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. All right, and I will share our screen. Okay, how is that? That's good. Okay. Hang on, I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. You ready? Uh, I'm seeing the the last slide. Wait a minute. Okay, there we go. All set? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here again, as Aaron mentioned, I'm Judy and he's John. <laughs> you can see our email addresses there and um, we'll show this again at, at the end if anybody wants to contact us for any more discussion about the topic. And we're hoping that in the next few minutes, um, everyone will learn how these discussions emerged, <clears throat> how different ways you might be able to incorporate something similar into your own classes, and um, ways that uh, we can share resources with you. So um, we were going to start a little bit, um, a little bit of a description about the Metacognitive Cafe. They're low stakes discussion forums that um, both John and I do in online classes. We do them weekly. And um, in each discussion, we're trying to get students to reflect a little bit on how they learn and become aware of the learning process and teach them or help them uh, realize what learning processes, what, um, what is more effective and um, ways that they can become aware of what they're doing that's not helping them and what they can be doing better and ways they can be more successful in their classes. And John, do you want to add anything to that? These run alongside our standard content discussion forums and they're very low stakes. In my class, it's 5% of the grade and the regular one is 15%. And students have put as, at least as much effort into these as they do in other aspects of the course. So it's worked quite well in that sense. And so in conversations John and I were having in the past, we were talking about some issues that we find in common with our students. I'm in the community college, so I have a lot of uh, first time college students um, or first generation students, um, students who may not be fully prepared for college. So I have a certain set of struggles that I, I see often in this with the students and John sees uh, some different struggles and we do have some that overlap. So, um, these are some guiding questions that uh, helped us. These are the types that lead toward the types of things that we're trying to address in these questions. And so um, how often do your students reflect on their learning practices? And one of the responses, follow-up responses we've had from students after participating in these dis discussions is, I liked being able to look back and reflect on myself with the help of the discussion questions. And how often do your students procrastinate? 
and we do we discuss time management and motivation and things like that and these and uh, now we have students saying things like I always plan my homework and reading out ahead of time. How often do your students believe that they are visual auditory or kinesthetic learners. John do you want to well, this is an area where students have grown up with this myth. They've been taught this from the time they were in elementary school. Many of them have been tested regularly, and it often serves as a barrier to learning because students believe they can only learn in a certain way. And we wanted to see if we could break that myth to get students open to learning using all the sensors and not trying to limit themselves. And so we do address this straight on, and we do, and this will be shared in the resources too. But um, now the students have a new awareness of what, uh, what learning styles really are. How often do your students repeatedly reread material rather than use retrieval practice? And now we have students saying, I find that the most effective way of studying is by testing myself. And that's not something they'd be likely to say at the start of the class, that they've learned about retrieval practice and they see the benefits from it. But it's a bit, it's a bit of a reach because students generally like to just reread things over and over again until it's familiar, until they reach fluency illusion. And this is a nice way of getting them to see that they can actually make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. And how often do your students participate in discussions or assignments without completing assigned readings? And this is something I see a lot. Um, and <clears throat> now th after participating in a series of these questions, students can make comments like, I believe one should understand the material before continuing with the coursework, you know, which is critical in world history that they have a framework to build on. And how often do your students feel as if they are alone and struggling with difficult material? And this one is, um, really uh, important to us now. It was sort of a byproduct of the whole cafe as we found this huge sense of community building organically through these metacognitive cafe discussions. The students um, really are getting to know each other. They're sharing um, what's going on in their lives, what their work schedule is, how their home life's affecting their studying and different things that they've tried. And it's just been fantastic. So the, now the students, um, they're realizing that other students are experiencing the same struggles and they don't feel so alone or isolated. Um, and it's, it's just, it's really been great. And it often bleeds over into other aspects of the course. In the content discussions, I see students learning more, referring to specific cases of students and the struggles they face and the challenges they do in ways I've never seen before. When they're trying to apply the content to their regular lives, they actually know each other much more deeply. And it's, it's been really rewarding to see that. And so how often do your students get discouraged when they make mistakes? And now by the end of the semester, I think I will feel like I accomplished something. So there's more, again, there's more of that community and that um, sense that they're working with other people and uh, learning together. And that's what this is. The, so Metacognitive Cafe, in a nutshell, the students learn about learning together. And we could have told them these types of things, and we often have in the past, but when they hear these strategies from the peers and they hear their peers talking about ways they've implemented them and it's worked for them, it has much more of an impact. So this started for me a few years ago when we had a, a critical thinking initiative on our campus. And um, so I had, uh, we were using the Paul Elder model and the elements of thought and I integrated those elements of thought into our, the regular online discussions. And he really had students focus on bias and um, point of view and things like that. And noticed right away that once they were directed in a more thoughtful way, their, um, the, their responses really um, became more robust. Even I had gone through and counted like the words per post and they had expanded something like 40%. So that was impressive right away. Um, and then we, I kind of, we had another seminar with John Drager from um, Buffalo State, and he introduced us to Kimberly Tanner's 
um, discussion prompt. She's a biologist who writes a lot about this type of thing, and she has a table of metacognitive discussion questions that she uses with her graduate students. And so I took um, Tanner's table and kind of uh, reworked it for the 100 level, where um, you know a lot of what I do is just get the students to read and engage with the content and focus on it and then start to think about it. And so at that point, I split it out so that I still could have my course content discussions for that were higher stakes. And then um, when mine are, I do use points, so they're 25 points a question. And then these metacognitive cafe ones are just five points. And um, so that it's, it just runs along with the class and there is a topic every week and just kind of tried to take it from there. And at this point, John was doing them too yeah, and what prompted me to get interested in this, we've been doing a lot of reading groups on our campus from Make It Stick, from Minds Online, from Small Teaching. And one of the things that really comes out in the research on cognitive science is that the strategies that students believe are most effective tend to be least effective in, in terms of encouraging long-term knowledge, in terms of knowledge retention beyond exams the, the same day or the next day. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but basically what it comes down to is students take strategies that work in the short run and get them good grades on the types of assessments they normally have, but then they forget most of it really quickly. And I wanted to work on ways of encouraging students to adopt techniques where they could learn things in foundational courses that would move on to upper level classes. So they don't have to learn everything new every time they start a new course in the discipline. And so then we tried to sort of take the discussions to the next level by adding um, uh, videos and articles and things like that to, into the discussion prompts. Um, John, do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, one of the things that came up is the first time through, I would find a video or a short article and I'd use that as a discussion prompt. But what I was finding is on some issues like retrieval practice, repeated testing, interleaving, and particularly the discussion of learning styles, some students were really resistant. They said, but I've learned this my whole career throughout elementary school and many of my college classes. My teachers have been telling me just to reread things over and over again until, they, until I learn it and that I should find out what my learning style is. And they resisted things because they were just hearing from one source. In one case, someone said, well, yeah, I know this cognitive scientist talked about these two studies that were done, but I'm sure there's other studies because otherwise I wouldn't have heard so much about this. And so I started putting in more readings and normally they're listed as for additional readings on this, you may refer to these studies. And many of students have started to do that. And it's really rare for students to go out and request more information, but I found in this they have. So then um, after each semester or, you know, each time we go through these discussions, we ask students for feedback and um, it has been overwhelmingly positive and we were getting responses along the lines of, um, <clears throat> I know I will continue to use the techniques I developed in this class going forward, which I love to see, especially with these you know, brand new college students. And we talk a lot about transfer and how they can carry these skills with them into other um, courses. And I cannot begin to say how this course has helped me, which we choose to interpret positively. And um, I appreciate the information about more effective learning methods and they are actually useful. So, um, so while I do teach history, um, the learning methods, you know, I always say if, if we can teach them how to learn and how to learn effectively and how to carry that over, then they can learn anything. So um, it's really rewarding when we spend the semester working with the students like this and then get this type of comment. And we, we truly hope that um, they do carry these with them going forward. And so I think, John, did you already post the links or? Um... I did and Aaron did as well. Okay. Uh, Bitly and the longer link both go to the same address. And there's a lot of resources there. All of our questions are there. Sometimes we've used the same ones. We haven't identified which course. I think it'll be pretty obvious from the context. We, to the extent possible, we try to tie the material to material that they're discussing during that section. So I put the discussion of 
addressing difficulties and dealing with difficult material in a section of the course where I know students are going to struggle. And it's really improved students' attitude where they used to get discouraged. They're really encouraged to see that other people are having the same challenge and to share ideas on what's worked effectively for them. It's a nice just-in-time type of an effect. Yeah, and I try to do that with, um, with the research papers. We, a lot of my students uh, have not had English 101 yet, so they're trying to write a research paper. They don't know what a scholarly source is, and we try to break all that down in, in other areas of the course, but then we get into this metacognitive cafe discussion and really talk to each other about so what is a source and where can you find a scholarly source, and it's, uh, it's really been helpful. So um, now if you follow one of those links to that website um, if, and scroll way down to the bottom, there is a place where we would love to get your feedback. Any ideas that you might have about um, topics that may be missing from our list or other metacognitive cafe type issues that we could address or other ways um, besides a discussion that we could put some of this into a course. Um, and you're free, you know, to look at all the discussion questions, even if you want, um, can suggest another video or article or a modification to a question that anything like that would be greatly appreciated and we'd be happy to share that all out too. Oh, and there's that long URL yeah. and I forgot. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> And so now for us, um, you know, we're wrapping up for, for me here at GCC, this is finals week and I'm trying to get the grades done and, you know, looking at um, the courses that start in January and we kind of just say, well, what's next? What, what do we do? Do we keep, you know, I keep trying to revise the questions or, um, you know, clarify or whatever, but, <coughs> excuse me, but what is the next thing we should do? Um, John has some ideas. I've only used this in my online classes and they tend to be fairly small. They're usually 40 to 50 students or so, but much, most of my intro classes tend to have three to 420 students in them. And it's a little bit harder to use a discussion for this. So I'm gonna be working on developing some materials that I can incorporate as activities, some of which could be self-graded or others that could be simply graded or assessed um, to try to build this into my large class instruction. Um, and what I'd like to do is do a randomized control experiment where roughly half of the students will be exposed to this type of material and the other half will be exposed to standard introduction to college study skills types of things. Um, so we can see whether reflection on metacognition has a significant effect and following it up by looking at whether students are actually implementing that by looking at the number of attempts they make on quizzes that they can take over and over again and so forth. And also perhaps following them up if we get approval for this to see how they do in later courses. Yeah, I'd love to know how they do later on. Um, and I, uh, so I only teach online. I am in the instructional designer here, so I work full time during the day. So um, I teach typically two online history courses a semester, but I'm constantly revising my courses because I try to um, try out anything that faculty might wanna be trying in their courses first so they, we can see how it works and um, so I don't I never have the same course that go that is offered again and again so I really don't have um, that type of research available to me so um, any other suggestions that you guys might have again you could put into into the form that's on that web page and it would be it would be really interesting to see what other people think mm -hmm. So we went through that pretty quick, but if anybody- We did. Had... So yeah, we, we condensed this down from an hour presentation and yeah. <laughs> condensed it a little bit more. So yes, um, please put any questions in the chat or if we could unmute, unmute people or unmute yourself and just say them. Yes, everybody should have the option to hover over the screen and the little microphone will pop up and you can click that to unmute yourself and ask any questions. Hi, this is Robin. I have a question. Robin. Hi. Robin. Uh, 
Um, I did need to step away for a couple minutes, so I may have missed. Um, I see the um, the website that you have for the Metacognitive Cafe, but where in particular are the discussion questions that you're using with the students or the prompts? Let me here. Let me actually. Stop. Yeah, maybe we could just open up that link. I can in a in a second here. Let's see. Yeah, I didn't think of that, huh? <laughs> you can click on the link. Let's see. Um, okay, and then I'll share again. Reshare. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, is it sharing properly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So here's the page, and let me scroll down. The scroll is acting up. <clears throat> this survey is the questions that we asked at the beginning. Um, and then right here, uh, it says example metacognitive cafe questions, and the sample questions are posted in Google Drive. And this is a hyperlink right here. Okay, so I think I missed there. the link. Yeah, I know it's the uh, it's the WordPress and that, um, style that I chose, the hyperlinks don't look like hyperlinks. I don't know. I've tried it with different color combinations. Are you able to just underline? You know, formatting underline? No, it just but, doesn't. But yeah, I'll try to make okay. the links look Okay, thank you. Easier. That's what I was looking but, for. Yeah, so they're all there. Um, and I think we broke them into little uh, similar themes so they make more sense, like evidence-based learning methods. So they watch um, the learning styles and self-reflection and retrieval practice. Um, we also use a lot. I don't if if any of you um, attended CIT last year, and um, were able to meet Barbara Oakley. Um, we took I took her um, learning how to learn MOOC, and incorporated a lot of her stuff in here. And that's what this tips for learning is from. That was a project from that MOOC that I did. Um, and her stuff is wonderful for this type of thing. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I guess I, I'll take another question. This is Robin again. Um, any examples of student um, responses that you can share? Do you have any? Well, let's see. When we share this presentation, um, there are a lot in the notes, like the slide notes. Um, John, did we have any on this page? Well, in this page, we, we don't have the actual sample responses. We did have some of them or excerpts from them in an earlier presentation, but mm -hmm. we trimmed those down in the most recent one. Yeah, I do have, I have a giant document with, with all of them. Um, that would probably be overkill, but Robin, I can get more of those on, and I'll put a, a similar, uh, I'll do the same thing where we use a Google Doc and kind of compile them all in there, and um, I can send out, send you a note when that's ready. That sounds good. Um, do you have to encourage the students to reflect deeper? It, you know, they probably don't start out and are great reflective learners. What's the... You know, do you just prompt them or give them feedback or? I kind of start them out slowly. So um, so this semester I had ancient world and ancient Western tradition and I just start off with, you know, uh, what did you already know about the agricultural revolution? And you know, what did you learn from this chapter? You know, and what questions do you have? So that they, my focus first was to get them to open the book right and at least read the section about the agricultural revolution and then they can then they have to think like did i know this or not um you know what what's new here and what other what else do i want to know and then we just kind of build on it every week and get them thinking deeper and deeper and some of the videos will help them with that too and john did you have a response to that in general, I've been impressed by the amount of time and effort students put into this and using a post first discussion forum where they have to think about it and they can't look at what other people have posted first really helps with that. And generally people put in some 
very good reflections. And, and it got better and better when they started to see what other people were doing and responding to them. Great, you have um, some video examples to help the students start to understand what reflective thinking is. Is there one that you would recommend as the best kind of generic media example for that kind of instruction? Um, I don't know that I have one that's specifically on, on reflecting. John, do you have what did you I have don't. Um, generally, we just start off by defining what metacognition is and then trying to work to have them develop it. And one thing that Judy suggested, and I've been doing too, is just using a standard prompt, which includes the definition of metacognition to help focus their, their work. Right. And I ask them, um, you know, like, how, how would you explain metacognition to others? Things like that to you know, reinforce what it is and what, what it is they're trying to accomplish. Thanks a lot. I had a question. This is Jaws. <clears throat> can, can you hear? Yes. yes. Ah, so do you ever have students that will include poor strategies? Um, things like, you know, I crammed last night and did really well on the exam. And how do you deal with that? John, I'll let you answer that because I don't really give exams. <laughs> well, yeah, I have had students do that and they say it works for me. But what's been really nice is, you know, I can show them the research on it. But what's really nice is when other students respond. Um, I do this in, in one of the classes I do this. It's an intro economics one. But sometimes there's juniors and seniors in there. And in particular, one case, I had one student who was very persistent in doing this in the several of the discussions. And then a junior said, well, I used to think that too, but then I went and took upper level classes and I found I didn't remember this stuff and I've been forced to develop better habits. And when they hear that from the peers, it's much more effective. And generally peers will respond when they see something like that. And even though that may be a common practice, students often recognize that it's something they do because it's it's convenient, it's easy, they procrastinate and they need to do it. They generally recognize it's not a good thing to do. And when they hear other people talking about it and other students will often talk about specific strategies that they've developed over time that's helped them become better learners. And, and that I think is, or it appears to be fairly, fairly effective. Thanks. Anybody else? I'll stop the sharing and um, were there any questions in the chat? I have not seen any questions in the chat. I did put a link, uh, Judy, to the Learning How to Learn MOOC okay. because it starts today, actually. A yeah, new cohort right. does, so that was really kind of nice timing. Um, so if anybody's interested in checking that out, they can do that. And I believe she runs it just about every month. So if you mm -hmm. miss this one, it comes, it's coming up pretty regularly and it's a really good MOOC. I encourage my students to take it. That's a great idea actually for students, yeah. Okay, well not seeing any other um, questions, I'll go ahead and um, come up on our closing here. And I think there may have been a question that just popped up, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, thank you again uh, to John and to Judy for joining us and sharing your strategies. We appreciate your leadership and willingness to represent our Open SUNY community. We do realize that there, there also may be others in the community or on the call that have an interest in sharing a topic. If, you, if that is you, we would encourage you to submit a proposal for a fellow chat. We are scheduling those for the spring semester coming up. Today's session was recorded and we will make that available on the page where you registered. Um, I'll post all this in the chat for you momentarily so that you have that information. And you can also review any of our past fellow chats on our Open Studio website. So again, I just thank you for joining us and for all of you for uh, your time and your attention. We hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thank you for thank having you. us, Aaron. Absolutely. Thank you.